Bingo, we're back. One o'clock rock here on a given Monday. Exciting. Monday is like waking up all over again <laughs> with all these fabulous shows and people coming around. And right now we have Sarah Fagans. Um, she's a researcher at uh, HIGP, the Hawaii Institute of Geophysics and Planetology in SOAS, the School of Ocean and Earth Science and Technology, a world-class institution doing world-class things. You're a world-class researcher. <laughs> Welcome to the show, Sarah. Thank you. It's good to be back. <laughs> So the big news is you had a trip to the uh, Big Island, mm -hmm. and you took a bunch of uh, researchers with you, students, I guess, or mm -hmm. graduate students uh, from all over the country. What did you do there? Well, this is a workshop that um, myself and colleagues at UH, uh, Scott Rowland, Pete McGinnis, Mark, Bruce Hounson, we run this workshop every two to three years. And the idea is to take out graduate students from all over the country who are researching problems in planetary science, planetary volcanology especially, and who spend most of their time looking at images on computers and don't really get out into the field very much. So these workshops are designed to um, impart an education to these students, to take them out, show them what volcanic features look like in the field, in the flesh, as it were. Make it real for them. Yeah, make it real for them and show them how these features that they look at in their images uh, relate to features on the ground, boots on ground. Um, and so this is relevant for people um, conducting research on Mars, on Venus, the Moon, Mercury, on Jupiter's moon, so Io. The, the world, the universe is your, your onion, whatever it is. Yeah, yeah. And one of the key things about these workshops is um, you can have so many misconceptions uh, from looking at an image about how a physical process works live and there Hawaii is such a great place um, for analog features to planetary features we see a lot of features on Hawaii that look like things that we see on Mars on the moon on Venus etc um, and we take these these students and we put them on the ground and and nature's often far more complex than they think it is yeah. but they can start to get a feel for how processes work how features are formed how things look on the earth geological kind of uh, anal an analysis and yes yeah yeah v volcanology vul is geology isn't it? yes it's a branch of, of yeah. geology kind of a specific branch of geology um and we're so lucky here in hawaii to have these processes ongoing people yeah. can see how things form. what about the sensors now what you know you say sensors uh, and, and in fact the show is uh um, uh, making common sensors for Mars. <laughs> We're going to talk about Mars in a minute, but what about the sensors? What kind of sensors are you looking at when you go to the Big Island with a, a, a tour like this? Um, we have um, a set of images of different types for the features we see on, on the Earth. And these are um, satellite images, maybe Landsat images. The images taken in the thermal part of the electromagnetic spectrum, which gives us different um, information about the features we're seeing on the ground. We have radar images, which tell us about surface roughness. Um, so for example, an RR flow, which is one of these very clunky, uh, rough features, looks very bright in radar images. Mm. Hoi hoi flows, which are these smooth mm. surfaces. I like look, those better. Look, yeah, they're much easier to walk on. <laughs> they look dark in radar images. So um, we have radar data that can tell you a lot about the surface. We have um, LIDAR topography data. Um, so we'll have these, these different data sets for the features we're going to see in the field. Students look at the data sets, try and understand what they're seeing, but it's only when they get boots on ground. And then we have a set of images um, for, say, Mars. They might be visible images or topography. Cameras. or Yeah. Um, so ta different types of images taken with different sensors um, that tell us different things about the surfaces of the planets that we're looking at. So you show them the sensors. You show them where the sensors are, how you deploy and operate the sensors, and then you show them what's on the other end, what comes out. We show them uh, the, the images. They, they usually have a pretty good background in the type of instruments and sensors that are being used because they, they focus on a particular subject area for their research. Um, so um, when we're out in, in the field on the ground, we're, we're basically ground truthing the, the uh, images that we're, we're mm -hmm. seeing and the mm -hmm. inference that we can begin to make from looking at images. We're out there ground truthing and, and understanding really what's going on. Okay, so these sensors, uh, I mean, you're interested in this because you're interested in Mars. Mm. Give us a precis on, on Mars. So 2020, what's going to happen? What are you doing for it? Um, yes, uh, there's a, an upcoming mission to Mars called the Mars 2020 mission. Um, it will launch in July, August of 2020. 
Um, take a little while to get to Mars, and then early 2021 it lands. And this is another road. It's only four years away. I know it's coming out no quick, pressure. isn't it? <laughs> it seemed like a long way away when we wrote the proposal, but but things are moving along. Um, it's going to be another rover mission, um, similar to the the MSL Curiosity mission that's currently at the surface. Let me just take a moment and say <clears throat> that camera. I'm going to tell it, that camera. What is a rover mission? It's a mission with a robot. Yes, it is. It's, it's the, the spaceship drops a robot on the on the ground there on the surface of the planet, and then the thing goes around and it takes measurements and it has lots of sensors. Did I get that right? Yes, it, you did. Thank you, you did. Um, and this particular rover is about the size of a car. Um, it's got a bunch of wheels. Um, you can see on the graphic on the TV mm. um, oh, screen it is, here yeah. at the moment. It's cute. It does it's look cute, like doesn't a it? Like R2D2, <laughs> but m maybe with bigger feet. Yeah. And it's <laughs> it's packed with. It's got seven instruments on. Um, this graphic is showing um, one of the uh, laser instruments that analyze rocks, but just below um, that big eye with the laser coming out are two little eyes, which um, is the camera system. It's a stereo camera system. It's, it's called Mastcam Z. Um, that's the instrument on which I'm a co-investigator. Um, and that system will be um, taking photographs uh, in, in stereo of the surface to um, basically analyze the features that we see there, help with navigation, um, and, and tell us a lot more about the surface of Mars. That is so interesting. It looks like it's out of a movie. It could be in a movie. Maybe you can movie. make a movie before or after <laughs> the trip. When the trip goes in 2020, by the mm. way, how long, long does it take for the rover here to get there? Um, it will arrive in early 2021, um, and then we go through a terrifying phase of, of entry, descent, and landing where the rover has to make it safely to the surface. Um, so it's like uh, acting, uh, it's, it, it's in an orbit over the planet, over Mars? No, no, it reaches Mars and then, then um, the landing module is deployed and it, it uh, parachutes so down like onto the surface. landing module, yep. and then rover. Yeah, um, the landing module parachutes down, it has to slow down in order to, to reach the ground safely. It deploys a parachute, slows itself down a little bit, and then there's a maneuver, there's a um, uh, component called the sky crane where um, the lander module comes down, uh, it has thrusters to slow its descent, then it lowers the rover down on tethers. Um, and it's slowing itself down all the way down. And when it feels the rover hit the ground, it cuts the tethers and then and thrusts itself away. So oh, really? It, it so doesn't it flies away? It, well, it's sort of, it's a controlled crash landing, really. It doesn't want to crash on top of the rover, obviously. Right, right, right. Um, so it, it uses its thrusters to, to um, jettison it, it itself gas. away. And it lands somewhere else. Um, and In then the pieces. rover hits the surface. Yes. Yeah, it's that, that's <laughs> no longer needed. It's no yeah. good anymore. Well, there's gravity on Mars, so it's not yes. going to be, you know, like be you know, too light, uh, to, so it's not to crash. No, and, and, you know, this is a big rover this time, so, you know, they had to use new technologies um, to, to figure out how to land um, the Curiosity rover that's currently there and this rover, the 2020 rover, which is basically a, an improvement, but the same basic configuration. I have another aside I'd like to make. I'm going to address the camera for a minute. You know, Sarah is actually doing this stuff at the front end. She's the co-principal investigator of some of the equipment on this thing. And, I mean, it's really exciting to talk to you. <laughs> you are involved in something that all of humanity is interested in. And this is fabulous. You're making, you're making scientific history mm. in, in, in the name of humanity. And I'm talking to you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very excited to be involved in this. Um, I had a little bit of previous mission experience back in the early, late 90s on the Galileo mission. Um, but I had never been, the Galileo mission went to Jupiter, but I had never been involved in a, in a rover mission like this. Um, my role is, is that of a scientist. I'm not designing the instrument, but I will be using the instrument and interpreting the instrument's um, observations when we get to Mars. Mm -hmm. But in the run-up to that point, there's lots of, lots of different activities we're involved in from um, the whole team is involved in, you know, uh, instrument de design, planning for operations uh, when we actually are on the surface. Um, we have a number of working groups that are looking at different elements of the, the instrument itself and um, we also have a, uh, an education outreach component and uh, a working group that's focusing on landing site studies at this point. Oh, we want to talk about all of that here in the next <laughs> 20 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so how big is the team? Um, there are something like 30 co-investigators on the instrument team, the Mastcam Z instrument team, 
Now there are seven instruments total, so you know, multiply that 30 by, by seven. And then there are a whole host of um, uh, graduate students and collaborators that are affiliated with the, many of the um, co-investigators. The co-investigators are like CDS science personnel. Um, and then there are all of the engineers and project staff at the Jet Propulsion Lab, which is where this mission is run out of. So it, it escalates into uh, hundreds and hundreds of people very quickly. Yeah. This is how you make a spaceship. This is how you outfit all the rover equipment. Yeah, yeah. We're yeah. just the little camera instrument, but you know, there's so many other components of of this uh, rover vehicle that that have to come together in harmony to to make this thing yeah. work. To put it in perspective, you know, I read recently that Apple, for its cell phone, for the camera on its cell phone, there are 600 people working on the camera. <laughs> That's what it is with right. modern high technology equipment. You have to have the people and you have to divide the work, divide the science, the technology. Everybody has a role and then somehow you coordinate all that research in order to make the device. Yep. You know. Yeah, so exactly. your your principal device is the camera, the um, mass Cam Z camera. Camera, yeah, yeah. And it's actually and there it is. Oh there it is. Wow. Yeah, there it is. there's there's the diagram of the, the lens assembly there. And um, a big improvement um, from the current Curiosity mission that's on Mars um, is that uh, this camera has a zoom capability. So there are actually two cameras. So you're looking in, in stereo like mm -hmm. your, eyes, your eyes do, so mm -hmm. that you can um, get three-dimensional representations of the surface that you're How looking at. How far apart are the cameras? The cameras are about um, uh, nine, ten centimeters apart, I mm, think. Just like human eyes. Yeah, it's, it, they're not too far apart. Yeah. Um, and they can zoom up so that you can, you can see details um, when you're zoomed in and, and close to a target as small as maybe 0.6 hundredths of an inch, something like that, is the, is like the pixel microscope. side. Yeah, so, yeah when, you're, when you're zoomed in. And both eyes, can, both cameras can zoom in. Um, and at the same, they're, they're yes. precisely the they're, same. They're exactly the same. Um, and then each camera has a variety of different filters. So you can look at different wavelengths in the electromagnetic Infrared, spectrum. Infrared, ultraviolet, yeah. and all that. Yeah, that's right. You can you can look from basically um, short wavelength vi visible all the way to the near infrared. Um, and so there's each camera has seven narrow pass filters and I think four broad pass filters. And we do that because um, different rocks and different minerals on the surface have different responses at different wavelengths. So they look different min rocks and minerals look bright at different wavelengths in a different pattern. Um, and so what you can do by looking at the response in the different wavelengths through the different filters is, is um, interpret the compositions of the minerals and rocks that we're looking at. And, and this, would be, this would be in, in, uh, in coordination with other sensors yes. that are also looking at the same material. So yes. you get a combination of data on it, you can figure out anything you want. Really. That's right. There are, there are two other instruments. Um, one's called Sherlock and one's called Supercam. <laughs> Supercam. Sherlock. Sherlock, okay. yes. Right. Good, good acronym. <laughs> um, and they use a variety of uh, spectrometers and, and uh, laser uh, instruments to basically uh, examine the rocks at, uh, with lasers and at different wavelengths, which will provide complementary information to the camera system. Um, and those two instruments are specifically designed to look for um, biosignatures, that is, mm. evidence of oh. a potential microbial life. And, and so the camera, you said the camera can look at things very small and close, but mm. what about looking things far away? Yes, so telescopic it, as well? it, it, can, it can look up um, onto the horizon. Um, it's going to be a very useful instrument to aid in navigation of the rover as it drives around on the surface oh, sure. of Mars. Is it real time? Can you see it real time no. here at uh, Command Central? No, uh. it's, it's not real time, um, but uh, the downlink capabilities are, are very good and we can get the images back you know, basically on a daily basis. And with its 3D capabilities, with mapping the terrain in three dimensions, um, that, along with the navigational cameras, which is a separate sub subsystem, that allows the programmers to um, upload a series of commands um, which will let the rover navigate pretty much autonomously. Um, so we don't need that uh, necessarily that real-time interaction. S Semi-autonomous, then. Yeah, I mean, it's we give it instructions. We give it instructions, but also it, it it's smart enough um, 
to avoid obstacles that might present themselves if we haven't actually noticed them. You know, Sarah, this is Sarah Fagan. So she's a researcher at HIGP. Uh, we're going to take a short break, Sarah. And when we come back, we're going we're to talk about whether this would have been helpful for Matt Damon <laughs> on Mars. <laughs> we'll be right back. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Hi, I'm Ethan Allen, host of Likeable Science on Think Tech Hawaii. I hope you'll join me each Friday afternoon as we explore the amazing world of science. We bring on interesting guests, scientists from all walks of life, from all walks of science, to talk about the work they do, why they do it, and moreover, why it's interesting to you. What the science really means to your life, its impacts on you, how it's shaping the world around you, and why you should care about it. I do hope you'll join me every Friday at 2 p.m. for Likeable Science. Aloha, I'm Kirsten Baumgart-Turner, and I'm fortunate to be able to host Sustainable Hawaii at thinktechhawaii.com. I hope you'll join in with us every Tuesday from 12 noon to 1 p.m. to see the interesting people we have to share with you their information. Aloha. Okay, we're back with Sarah Fagans. She's a researcher at HIGP in SOEST at UH Manoa. <clears throat> Very exciting discussion about uh, making common sensors from Mars and cameras among them. So, <clears throat> you know, I don't remember the movie, um, you know, with Matt Damon, The Martian, all that well, but did he have this kind of technology with him? It sounds to me like what you're doing now is way advanced to what we could have done even a few years ago and what they used for the movie. Um, yes, he, he had a variety of technologies that um, I think at one point he, he drives off the go and, and cannibalize an old rover that happened to be on the surface in order to communicate back yeah. to Earth. I, d I don't remember it very well either. Yeah. Um, so uh, that was actually had a pretty sound basis in, in scientific fact. It wasn't, it wasn't too science fiction, actually. <laughs> you know, he, he did use some reasonable, um, the movie did use some, some reasonable scientific uh, developments. Um, and actually, I, I really enjoyed the movie. It was kind of fun. There were some aspects of his uh, habitat that were perhaps a little far-fetched. <laughs> um, but uh, there are projects on, on Earth uh, currently ongoing um, looking into um, how to make uh, habitats for uh, uh, for astronauts to live in on the surface of Mars in the future. Well, you're a, you're a volcanologist. Is mm -hmm. that your training? Yeah. In England, way back mm -hmm. when. Yeah. Oh, I mean, not not that long ago. That was a while ago now. <laughs> <laughs> and you came out here because you felt that you know this is where the action is, mm -hmm. uh, and the topography is, especially yes. on the Big Island, to uh, apply your knowledge of volcanology, which is really a, an Earth-based kind of science, mm. to other planets. What is the connection between volcanology and Mars? Uh, well, we look at the surface of Mars, and it's an incredible volcanic terrain for the most part. Everything on Mars started off as, as volcanic, even though it may have been modified now uh, or over time. Um, we have these huge volcanoes scattered around the, the planet. We have vast... Which were established the way volcanoes always are, yeah. with eruptions. Yes, yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, early on, the eruptions may have been more explosive. Um, later in Mars' history, it looks like they were more effusive. That is, lava flows um, produced them. We have vast uh, volcanic plains on the surface of Mars. So Mars is an obvious uh, target of study for somebody who's interested yeah. in planets and, and yeah. volcanoes. And a volcanologist will be able to understand these processes on Mars mm. because of her training mm. in volcanology here on Earth. Yeah. yeah, and Hawaii is a great a great analog site for planetary volcanoes because the compositions of the lavas erupting are, you know, approximately similar. Um, the types of features we see on Earth uh, are very similar. Um, coming up on the screen here, we have we have a, a recent map of the uh, Big Island volcano, mm -hmm. um, Kilauea, and its latest lava flows. Um, this, are, this is a, a, a breakout, a new breakout that started about two months ago, and what you're seeing... This is current, this is happening. Yeah, this is, this is current. Uh, as of last week, this map was produced. And the light red is lava flows that have happened since uh, about two months ago. Um, and the bright red, the dark red, is new flows that have happened as of last week um, within the space of a couple of days. So you can see um, the ocean is down to the to lower right, and the gray is the flow field that's been built up, or part of the flow field that's been built up since 1983. 
um, at Kilauea Volcano. So we were lucky enough to get out and see active lava last week during our workshop. You um, saw you saw this live, and yes, we did. And this is, is this now. This is a map that was created with some of those sensors you were talking about. No, this is a map created by. Um, the United States Geological Survey. Um, they've been mapping this flow of field um, for, for decades now. Um, and they have a, a, the Hawaiian Volcano Observatory, which is a branch of the USGS, has a key role in monitoring the activity and making sure people are safe, mm -hmm. et cetera. So they go out every week, uh, a few times a week, and, and map the new areas of lava by um, either on foot um, or um, uh, by flying around in a helicopter and mapping mm. the margins of the flow. So they provide this on their, their website um, as a public service. And we were lucky enough to, within a couple weeks uh, before our workshop, the lava flows came down close enough for us to be able to walk to. Um, and you can walk to it from the uh, park side, which is the, the, the west side, or from the Kalapana side. Uh, which is the, the right side of this map. And it's kind of a, you can see the flow's right in the middle of the flow field there, so it's kind of a long walk to get to. It's about, um, you know, four and a half miles along the emergency route road there. You, so you walk from the green part in, mm. into the center mm. of the gray. Yes. And then you get close to the the pink and red part. Yes, that's right. And as w when we went out last week, um, the, the tip, the red tip, um, was probably a, a half mile in from that whether the road passes beneath it. Um, and this emergency route actually was put in um, by uh, FEMA over the last year or two. Um, you recall when the lava flows were flowing down to the town of Pahoa, yeah. um, there was a lot of concern that uh, residents of Pune would be cut off and wouldn't have a way out around the, the east side so of the flow field. So that's why they built the road. So they put the road in there, which you can't drive on, but you can walk on. Well, speaking of walking, I mean, how close can you get to that pink and red area in the map? I mean, I always, I always felt that if you walk too close, you know, you'd see your shoes sizzle, <laughs> and you feel very hot in the bottom, <coughs> bottom of your feet. Well, right at the the, <coughs> the end of that flow field, it's a very sedate kind of uh, flow emplacement um, called Pahoehoe Hoi Lava, which which advances very slowly. Um, you don't want to stand next to it particularly because the hairs on your arms will singe, but you can get, you know, within 10 feet or so, um, not particularly yeah, comfortably, it's very hot. Just be careful about where you're standing, that's you all. Need to, you need to know what you're standing on and you need to keep an eye out at all times uh, as to where breakouts from the flow are occurring. Um, and, you know, for anybody who does want to go out and visit these flows, uh, some things you need to know are it's a long hike when you get off the road, it's it's very rough terrain. You need to wear long pants. You need to, it's good to have um, leather gloves or gardening gloves because if you fall over when you're off the road, there's no trail or anything, Ooh. you can cut yourself very <coughs> that's easily. The, that's it, the aha lava. This is, a, this is actually Pahoehoe -hoe <coughs> lava, but when it fractures, it's very glassy and very sharp. So if you fall, you can cut yourself pretty badly. So um, you mentioned aha, uh -uh, mm -hmm. oh oh, and la Pahoehoe. Pahoehoe, ah ah. Well, Lapa Hoi Hoi is the place. Yes, it is. On, yeah. the, on the North Coast, the Hamukua Coast. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So Pahoe Hoi is is a very uh, relatively smooth surface lava, but actually, when it when it cools and fractures, um, it it becomes sharp. very sharp. Yeah. Uh, uh, I mean, you can walk over it pretty easily. Well, relatively easily. That's the crumbly kind. Uh, uh, uh is the really the, the rough, kind. lucky um, oh, kind. Oh, oh, is the smooth kind. No, uh, uh. uh, uh okay. <laughs> <laughs> I have to spend more time on the big island, you know, <laughs> hiking actually. And so, um, so, you know, you talk about sites, you know, and then sites, locations are important. And I know that you're involved in the siting, the, the selection of the site for the Mars rover trip, yeah? Yeah. Uh, what's that like? What, what are the considerations there? Um, well, the, the, the whole planetary community is invited to participate in selecting the next site. Um, and any site that gets proposed has to meet a set of engineering constraints and a set of geological constraints that are defined by the mission objectives. So the engineering constraints involve things like uh, where is it safe to land the rover? It can't be anywhere that's too steep. It can't be anywhere that's too dust covered because the rover might sink into the dust and dusty areas are no good for taking measurements of rocks anyway. It can't be in an area where it's going to land on a big rock and get stranded. Um, it has to be in a certain latitude band. 
um, and it has to be at a certain elevation, um, quite a low elevation on the planet to give the uh, parachute enough time to slow uh, the, the lander down. The atmosphere is about the same as Earth? I no, mean, the atmosphere in, in is very, th very, th very thin on Mars. Uh, okay. um, uh, so to use SI units, the atmosphere on Mars is 600 pascals, whereas on Earth it's about 10,000. So it's very thin on Mars. Mm. So the parachute is not all that effective. Yeah. No, I mean, it works some, um, but uh, with a mission as big as this, that's why they have the thrusters on the lander to slow itself down yeah. even more. So those are basically the engineering constraints, where you can go and, and where you can land safely. Yeah. And then the geological objectives or the mission objectives for the science include things like, we want to go to a location that has potential for preserving or, or the production and preservation and exposure of um, microbial life. Um, where, where can we go that we're most likely to discover life on Mars? Is there really a possibility of microbial life on Mars? Yes, there most certainly is. I mean, we know now that um, there are many areas on Mars that had uh, liquid water, which is, you know, a key, key envir uh, environmental need. You need water for need. microbial existence. Yeah, yeah any, any form of life really needs water. We need somewhere that's relatively warm, so that water usually has to be liquid. Um, so we know from all of the spacecraft that have been at Mars over the last few decades, we, we've characterized a lot of these places very well from orbital imagery, from sensors on board the orbiting spacecraft. Um, and we can tell what kind of environments are, are there in broad terms. So um, it needs to be somewhere where, where we can have produced, preserved, and exposed microbial life. We're also interested, and that, and that usually confines us to older terrains on Mars, um, because if life arose, it was probably early. Mm -hmm. um, we also, the, the mission objectives also want to um, uh, demonstrate technologies that can be used later on for future human exploration, so that uh, has some bearing on where we go as well. And so one of the key places that we're looking at are impact craters um, that had hosted lakes at some point in the past. Um, and often you'll see channels running into these lakes, and those channels can bring materials and deposit them in deltas in the lake. It's those materials that you're interested yes, in? Yes, yeah. Life could have formed in the lake, or, or life could have been transported and deposited in the lake. And when you form deltas in standing bodies of water, you can, you can um, uh, bury and fossilize um, life forms so, very so you're quickly. you're not necessarily looking for life forms that are alive today, you're looking also for historic life forms that yeah, we can find evidence there was life before. Yeah, I mean, it's, it, it's l much less likely that there is life form existing today just because it's arid and cold now. The Mars, in all likelihood, had much higher atmospheric pressure and a much warmer environment in the past. There's no possibility of a Martian then. We won't see little men running around. No, no, I uh, just want to be clear yeah. about that. Yeah. <laughs> now, you're going to be at the JPL laboratory, the control, what do you call it, mission control there when this happens? It, that's right. Um, when the, the lander lands, um, uh, all of the co-investigators and collaborators on each of the instrument teams, so this is many hundreds of people, will all um, go to JPL and spend the first 90 Martian days. Um, <sighs> wow. In operations, basically. This is, this is not during the flight, but it's w upon arrival. Upon arrival, when right. we're first navigating around. It takes, around. what, a year or two to, to get there? It'll take uh, something like six or seven months to get there, I believe. Oh, okay. Um, so not too long, but once it lands, um, we all go to JPL and, and learn how to work together as a team. Um, after the first 90 days, we return to our home institutions, but we still are involved remotely because you can do everything over sure, the internet sure. nowadays. Yeah, um, speaking of which, I, I'd like to make a special request, okay? Sarah, you know, we have Skype here. Mm -hmm. We do a lot of shows all around the world on Skype. And when you're out there on mission control, maybe, just maybe, we could have one show with you. Sure. Where you talk to us from Mission Control <laughs> in JPL in Pasadena, California. I see no reason not to. Tell us what's going on. Okay, I'm going to remember this. <laughs> <laughs> That's, Sarah, <laughs> That's Sarah Fagans. She's a researcher at HITP, involved in one of the most interesting research 
events and mm -hmm. experiences you could possibly imagine going to Mars and learning all you have to learn about equipment and sensors and what's to look for, where to go. God, these great questions, you're at the center of it. I want to be with you. <laughs> <laughs> Research in Manoa, making common sensors for Mars. Sarah Fagans, thank you so much. Sure, you're welcome. Bye -bye. <laughs>